What's the difference between an engineer, a project lead, a manager, a VP? In this video, you'll learn a typical engineering organizational structure and how each role differs and how you could potentially move into some of these roles as you progress in your career. I created a crude diagram here to show you what a typical hierarchy looks like. Now, this is not the only way to structure a company, but in all of the places that I've worked, I am currently an engineering manager in the power industry. And of course, this varies from industry to industry or manufacturing and what have you. But typically you have is the rule of threes. Okay. So that means that any one person should not have more than three people below them. So if we start from a top down approach here, at the very top, we have vice president and then we have the director. So now this VP up here might only have three or four directors reporting directly to him. Also, that might not be the case. They might have 10 or 15 depends on the organization. But then guess what? They would just have more and more vice presidents, right? So the director is over here. Now that role is crucial to the company. Every single one of these roles is crucial from the very top to the bottom. Obviously, as as you climb higher, higher up into a hierarchy, you have a lot more responsibility, not only for your own family, your own life, but also the people that are underneath you and even above you, because you are now making major, major decisions. And if something goes wrong, well, you're held liable and people could potentially lose their jobs, which is why as as you move into some of these roles, you know, obviously the pay is more because of the extra responsibility. The director's job is to make sure that everybody underneath him here is working in cohesion towards a specific goal. Now they might be divided up. So let's say that you're in a consulting company, the director might have different clients. Okay, let's say that you are at a large utility, well, then this director is going to be overseeing a major discipline. So maybe the transmission division or or the substation group or the generation division. So all of these are subdivided up. Typically, the larger an organization is. So if you've got, let's say, 10,000 people in your organization, there might be 10 rungs to this hierarchy. And the roles start to expand significantly because these companies now are working in so many different uh, avenues and they've got to keep themselves as organized as possible. So yes, another reason why over here you might go from director to VP to senior VP to associate VP, and then to general manager and then CEO and so on and so forth. Those roles have all of the money that's behind them. And so they have to keep gathering information as they go. So it's hard to make decisions. So imagine yourself here that you're now in the VP level. It's hard to make decisions if you are overseeing this VP might have 300 people underneath them. So it doesn't make sense now for this one VP to have every single person underneath them that reports to them. No, they need to be able to oversee see a manageable amount. There have been many studies done to determine how many people you should have underneath you. And the answer to that is very complex. It depends on the role. If you are in a high complex role, such as these directors and VPs that have a lot of things to oversee, they really shouldn't have more than four five, six people underneath them. If you are overseeing a manufacturing facility, well, those people that are working the manufacturing, they're very, very skilled, and they've got very specific roles to do. So then that manager might be able to oversee 15 or 20 or more, it really depends on kind of where you are. But for our example here, in a typical engineering firm, meaning that your efforts lead to product creation, or to the assistance of a client with their designs, things of that nature. Okay, so meaning most of the people that you're working with are technically based. Okay, let's keep going down our hierarchy. So the director typically has three or four reports. So these are, let's say engineering managers, and these ones are divided up further down into discipline. Now this here, this section here is considered mid management. Okay. And what that means is that you are tasked with if you are this engineering manager, number one, this is by the way, where I fall at about in my organization that I'm working with in my company, if you fall here in the middle, that means that you probably have an equal amount of rungs below you as well as above you. So in this role here, you may be tasked with overseeing a specific client, a specific need for that client, okay, or a specific product that you might be creating. In my case here, I oversee a specific discipline for the client that we work with. In my case, it is substation design. And specifically, it is in protection and controls. So in substation design, you have multiple disciplines in order to build a substation, you have to have a civil team, you have to have a team that does the grounding grid, a team that does the protection and controls, which is all the electrical stuff that connects all the components and how the substation functions, you have a team that does the physical design, which is the 
the actual layout of the entire station. You have a team that does a transmission line design, the transmission lines coming into it, and so on and so forth. There's relay settings, there's standards, there's all these different disciplines. So I oversee a specific discipline. And on my team, I have team leads. So on my team, I've got leads. And these are senior engineers that senior engineers or even designers, and we can discuss the differences there that have the knowledge, the leadership and the communication skills to lead specific projects. In my case, I have about five different team leads that I work with directly. Now all of our roles differ. So I'm lucky enough in my role that I do see some technical aspect of what I'm doing, meaning I do still see prints, I do check some prints, am I working directly on the projects at this point? Not typically, because that would take away from the expertise that my team and project leads have built. My role is not necessarily to work on the projects directly, it is to make sure that they're getting done with high quality on time. And I have to manage our workload as well as you know, the manage the team below me and the team above me. This is a this is a nice spot to be in an organization. I'm very thankful for that. My project leads now this is now the technical aspect of everything that we do here. Okay, so it starts with my role and below these project leads are responsible for executing the project, making sure that we have enough time and resources to do them and making sure that we attend meetings and all of these things. So all of the meetings begin over here. And they're typically attended by the engineering managers and the project leads. Uh, there are these project leads, you could also call them I wouldn't call them project managers. That's a whole different thing. These are project leads, meaning that they are leading their team to complete this one part of the project, a project manager, for instance, oversees the entire construction, in this case, here, the construction of a substation, and that that person has a very different role, we can maybe make a video about that later. These team leads themselves are typically mid level to senior level engineers, you're looking for at least five years of experience and on and on. They are also senior level engineers who have now become subject matter experts, SMEs. That's a very good acronym to know. Now, why have they become subject matter experts? You'll notice that in engineering, I keep discussing this in my prior videos, there are typically two routes that you can take one to go into management, another to go into becoming a technical expert, both of these routes in their careers are compensated. Well, you just have different responsibilities that come along with it. So if you're a subject matter expert, then most likely you might be leading a team or be just advising and consulting these these teams when everyone has questions. Now we get into the deep part of of the technical work here. Now this is where entry level engineers and engineers uh, that are still learning the trade learning whatever it means to be a professional in whatever specific industry in this case here, we're in the power industry, these entry level engineers are here and they also work with designers and support staff. So what is a designer, a designer is somebody who does not have a four year engineering degree, but has a technical uh, degree typically a two year. So designers are are equally in many cases as skilled as the engineers It's just that the difference there is they do not have all of the responsibilities that the engineer has. So they are working alongside the engineers on these projects. And now in the same way that we mentioned, you're dividing up in threes. So in this hierarchy, we'll just say that there are two, three or four different team members working on a specific project. In our case, let's just take an example. My that specific project might just be designing substation XYZ. Okay, let's call that a single project that doesn't have to be in your particular case, if you're in a different industry, it could be to work on widget XYZ, or to work on client XYZ, maybe this team works together on a very specific client, depending on how big you are, right? That also matters if a company has 50 people, well, you might not be structured like this, people are gonna be wearing different hats. I've worked in organizations that have had 10 12,000 engineers, and some as low as 100. So it does really depend on how the company is structured. This is a typical example example, but this project lead may have two or three different projects, and he may be working with that same team, or a couple different people, it just really depends on the workflow and the structure. And that, that maybe is too nuanced for this video. So this lead might be responsible for multiple projects. But this lead here has a very large responsibility in that his or her name will be on the drawings when they are to be submitted. Okay, that adds a different level of complexity. So now your name is on the drawing. If you're in an industry where you have to have PE stamp, that means most likely their name will be on there with a PE stamp if they have one, if not, then that goes up to the managers and so on and so forth.
forth, or somebody else to oversee and check the project with a PE to stamp the drawings. Not every industry requires having a PE. In the power industry, it is recommended. So you have engineers, designers, and then I also put support. So support staff are everybody else. So that could be administration assistant. You might have a scheduling assistant. You might have HR on uh, that, that helps you with just with everything that you're doing, obviously with hiring and all that. They're not going to help you on the technical role, but really the support staff, you might have drafters. Now a drafter is a role in engineering that has sort of died out lately. I think kind of, kind of COVID has really reduced that. Their jobs are to take the engineering prints and modify them. They're not really taking their inputs into these drawings and modifying them. They're just taking marked up prints and modifying them. But some teams might still have drafters and that's that's common enough. And that's where actually you, you go to school, not for a technical degree. It might just be for something very specific to learn how to use software. That's a very, very specific technical degree. So that is a typical engineering hierarchy. Now, what are some factors that affect this hierarchy? Well, the first one being the nature of the work. If the nature of the work that you're doing is very, very complex, well, then guess what? You you can't be overseeing 20 different people. If it's very complex, then you might only have two or three people on your team as a scribe. Another thing to think about too is what is the experience of the actual team? If you have a lot of junior people, well, that they would require more oversight. If you have more senior people, you might be able to let them let them kind of run with it. It really depends on what the team dynamics are. Thirdly, you have to look at the technology that's provided. So, so now we are coming into AI and we kind of keep joking um, among our team. Are they going to have a substation GPT software pretty soon when you just type in what you need and it spits out all these different designs. Who knows? Maybe depending on what kind of systems have also been in place and the technology that you're using, that might also change the team structure. And then finally, also just the leadership style. Is the manager very hands-on? Are they hands-off? I like to think that I'm more hands-off. However, I'm very lucky and blessed that I have a very experienced team. So therefore, I can be more hands-off. If I didn't, I would have to be more hands-on. So you have to adjust to the people that you're working with. If you're here, you're probably wondering how you might be able to advance your career once you enter engineering or if you're already there right now. And for that, I've actually made another video which will pop up here and that goes over the career ladder and how each role is different and what kind of responsibilities you might expect as well as what kind of pay levels you enter. I hope this video was helpful. Like and subscribe and go check out the video over here about how you can progress in your career.